Hello. This is a video about combined stress. What we have here is a solid cylindrical tube. It has a diameter of 10 millimeters. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead because I always do this as the first step. If I'm given a diameter, I just always stick with the radius. All right, so I've got a diameter of 10 or a radius of five millimeters. It's been bent at 90 degrees and it lies in the XY plane. So we have a planar structure in XY with one bend in it, one 90 degree turn. We've got two forces applied, one, two. We also have a, a moment or a torque that is applied about X. This picture right here is just a zoom in of this slice. So that's like a little DX slice at that cut plane. And we've got four points, A, B, C, and D as shown. And we, we, what we would like to do is compute the combined state of stress at A, B, C, and D. For all of these combined loads, combined stress problems, basically there's two parts. Your first part is the statics. Um, and I'm going to do that up here. So statics work. More specifically, we're doing the equations of equilibrium. And the second step is your stress analysis. That's interesting. OK, I'll put that over here. So stress analysis will be the second part of our problem. And we'll do that over here in the left column. Okay, and all of these other picture, pictures on the screen, this is just where we're gonna illustrate all of those stresses at points A, B, C, D on the stress cube. All right, let's start off with our statics work. So we wanna run through all six equations of equilibrium. I'm gonna do this pretty quickly. If you want a more thorough review, there's another tutorial posted, 36A, that will give you a more thorough review on that. Uh, the forces are easy, we just flip the directions. So 90 uh, newtons up, that results in 90 newtons down right here. That's in the negative y direction. 120 newtons in the positive x needs 120 in the negative x right there. And we do not have any forces applied in Z, so I'm not going to show a Z direction force on this picture. Now we're going to go to the moment equations. And since these often give students a little more trouble, I'll go ahead and write them out up here. So let's do summation of uh, not forces, but moments. And we're going to get a bigger pen. The summation of moments about the, the x-axis that is coincident to the centroid of the cut plane. In other words, we're looking at the moments about that axis right there. I can draw it over here as well if that's easier. That is going to be equal to zero. Okay, does the 90 Newton force cause a moment about that x-axis? And the answer is no, because it is coincident. That line of action goes straight through that axis. So we don't need to include that in our calculation. How about the 120 Newton force? Does that cause a moment, a tendency to rotate about x? Nope, because it's parallel. And therefore, you can never have a moment about an axis due to a force that is parallel to that axis. OK, let's go to our third load. So we've got a 20 Newton meter applied moment or torque about x. So we'll need an equal and opposite one at the cut plane. Use your right hand. Use your right hand. Simulate that rotation, that tendency to rotate. Your right fingers should be curling around the tube and your right thumb should be pointed in the positive x direction. Okay, if that torque tends to rotate the body with respect to po double arrow positive x, that means the equal and opposite one right here, I'll switch this to orange, has to be double arrow negative x like that. Okay, 
So it's still going to be 20. So we're just going to grab this number. And I'm just going to go ahead and do a preemptive unit change. So my stresses we know are megapascals. We know a megapascal is a newton per millimeter squared. So I'm going to do 20 E3 newtons times millimeters to preload units that will be useful for me. OK. So m sub x is equal to minus 20 E3 newtons times millimeters. That minus sign is just a nod to the fact that the double arrow is pointing in the negative x direction, not the positive. Let's go to our next summation of moments about y is equal to 0. And does the 90 newton force cause a moment about the y-axis that's coincident to the centroid of the cut plane? Nope, because it's parallel. OK, forget that one. What about this one? Does the 120 Newton tend to rotate the body about y? And the answer is no, because that force is coincident with that axis. And therefore, it will not, cannot cause a moment about that axis. Uh, last up, so this is an applied moment about x x is not y and so that one's zero so i'm happy to happy to report that there is no moment about y so i'm leaving the zeros off the picture if you wanted to draw them in and label them as zero uh, you can do that but i'm just omitting them all right cool so we've gone through five equations of equilibrium there's one left summation of moments about x is equal to zero. And I'm going to save myself a little space. Or I'm going to I'm going to need this space in a minute. So I'm going to put this one down here and just clean up that little tag okay, so that we remember which one goes there. OK. All right, let's do a let's do a quick check. First question, does the 90 Newton force tend to cause, oops, and we're doing Z, we're doing Z. We're on to Z now, there we go. All right, does the 90 Newton force tend to pivot the body or tend to rotate it about that Z axis that is coincident to the centroid of the cut plane? And the answer is yes. Okay, so we know we're gonna get a non, zero calculation here. What about, what about the, really interesting, there we go. What about the 120 Newton force? Does that one tend to rotate the body about this Z axis? And the answer is yes, right? Because it's perpendicular to that axis. It runs in that direction. It's offset by that amount. So that one's going to be in play too. Okay. What about this one? Is that going to do anything with respect to Z? No way. So we can ignore that one. So we're going to have two terms. And since I don't know, you know, I don't necessarily know at this point, unless I'm doing math on the side or math in my head, uh, the sign of the internal moment about z here is my here is my suggestion change this back to z i see what happened okay so let's assume that the internal moment at that plane which i'm calling m sub z is positive and that positive sign just means double arrow positive z direction okay and i'll i'll put this in here as a placeholder so we're assuming that m sub z is going that way. And then we can just carry it through the equation of equilibrium. And if we assumed incorrectly, we'll just change the sign and erase that and change the direction of the arrow. OK, I'm going to switch to a finer pen and run through this equa um, equilibrium equation. So uh, the first term I think is I'm going to put, I think I'm going to do 0 equals. And then my positive m sub z will be my first term. That's my unknown moment. I'm just assuming a direction, put a positive term in my equations of equilibrium. All right, next up, we'll do the 90 Newton force, the perpendicular distance between the Z axis and the 90 Newton force. That's 400 
millimeters. Okay, that tends to rotate the body double arrow negative Z, so we will give it a negative term here. And I want to be super duper clear about what I'm doing in this equation and how it's a little bit different from what we did before. Okay, so in this equation for the X moment summation, I only had one term. So I didn't need to go to the trouble of making an assumption. I just knew that the internal had to be equal and opposite to that. I could do that one without writing it out as a more formal equation. But there's a little more complexity with respect to Z. So here I'm going to write out the full equation, put all my terms in there, assume this is positive, do the math, and let the math bear out the solution. Okay, so I'm going to have three terms. That's my unknown. There is my second term, and now my third term is going to be my 120 Newton force. That one has a perpendicular distance of 125 millimeters up to Z. And ask yourself if that is a positive or negative rotation about Z. You're using the right hand rule and you should be able to have a right thumb positive Z. That is a positive rotation. All right, calculator time. So minus 90 times 400 plus 120 times 125, then take that and move it to the other side, changing the sign. And the result that you will get is M sub Z is equal to positive 21 E3 Newtons times millimeters. And all that means is that our assumption that M sub Z was positive happened to be correct. And so I will just label this 21 E3 Newtons times millimeters. And now my little free body shows all of the internal forces and moments at the cut plane that contains points A, B, C, D, and A, A B, C, and D. Okay, now on the back side of this little differential disk, you will have equal and opposite forces and moments. They're hard to see or draw here, so I'm only going to show them on the front side, but I need you to understand that in equilibrium, I would see each one of those would have a partner in crime going equal and opposite to its direction on the back face for static equilibrium. All right, that is the statics work. So we have completed step one and we have determined um, essentially this free body right here. And this is what we're going to use going forward. So as we move into the second part of the problem, which is mechanics of materials, there is the stress analysis. Everything we need is in this bubble. What I've done in this table is I've itemized out points A, B, C, and D. And I've itemized out all six of these possible types of stress. All right, so for this problem, and we're gonna do all the stress analysis calcs over in the left margin. So we're gonna just kind of work top to bottom. So axial stress. So we're going to do stress equals N over A. Do we have an axial force? We do. It's 120 Newtons of compression. We're going to see that compression. Let me get one. Let me get, um, I think I'm going to use just a dark indigo color. See how that shows up. Okay, so there is the compression. There is that axial compression. There is the axial compression. There is the axial compression. And we just calculate it over to the left side. So my normal force is 120 Newtons. Area of a circle, and remember the radius is five. Remember, I'll just rewrite it here so that we have it. Radius equals five millimeters. Okay, so pi times five squared 
millimeters squared. Punch that through calculator and you'll get 1.53 megapascal. And you'll get that each one of these points, right? So this one, that one, that one, and that one. Let's go on to the next one. So the next row says that we need to figure out the stress caused by bending about y. Okay, so now we're going to be thinking of like m d over i, d being distance, not diameter, and bending about y. Well, if we look up here, do I have anything bending about y? Is there a double arrow on the y-axis? And the, the answer is no. So this one is going to be a zero. Let me get an even bolder marker if you can believe it. Let's get this one zero. OK, and the reason why that's zero is that the moment the internal moment about y is equal to zero. And if you don't have a moment, of course, you don't have any stress. All right, let's go to the next line of our table, the next row of our table. And the next row says, what stress is caused by bending about z? Do we have an m sub z? Yep, we sure do. There it is right there. All right, so we're going to use that same equation stress equals m moment d distance over i moment of inertia about the axis of bending and we're going to plug in a moment of 21 e 3 newtons times millimeters okay now if my axis of bending is z here then points b and D are going to get zero stress. Points B and D will get zero stress. Points A and C are located at a distance of radius R five millimeters from the axis of bending. I'll plug that five millimeters into my equation. In the denominator, the moment of inertia for a solid cylinder is pi over four radius to the fourth. Remember not to get mixed up between the I moment of inertia and the J polar moment of inertia. They are not the same thing and they have different formulas. Okay, so we're gonna run that through our calculator. And we will get a stress of 213.9 megapascals. Now we need to figure out um, where the tension is, where the compression is, and direction. Let's do direction first. So is it x, y, or z? And the answer is this will be a stress in the x direction because x is the axis normal or perpendicular to the cut plane, or it is the longitudinal axis for the portion of the member we're interested in. All right, now we got to use our right hand rule to figure out where the tension is, where the compression is. So what we need to do is look at this free body. Imagine stabilizing the back face with your left hand. Um, with your right hand, use the right hand rule, and I want you to rotate the front disc about that axis. What you should see is A kind of going into the page there, C coming out of the page here. We could try to sketch that. It's really kind of hard to do, <laughs> but it could look something like that. Hopefully you can kind of see what I mean by that. Anyway, since A is going into the page, that is compression. So point the arrows toward the body. Since C at the bottom is coming out of the page, that is tension. And both of these will have that magnitude of 213.9 megapascals. Um, now, am I super picky about whether you're using three sig figs or four sig figs in this step? And the answer is not really. Um, if you if you had just written down 214 here, that would be okay as well. Um, 
the idea is that I want my final answers at the bottom down here, the combined state of stress, that's where I want to show those three sig figs of precision. So as long as when I go to sum that, you know, somewhere I've got that fourth sig fig in the, in the mix, if you wanted to write this as 214, um, I would be okay with that. Let's go to the next row, St stress caused by shear in the y direction. Do we have shear in the y direction? Yes, we do. There's a y direction. There is a 90 Newton shear force with respect to y. Okay, so we could do this the easy way or the hard way. So we could use tau equals VQ over IT if we had a lot of time to burn, but we can also use the shortcut equation. It only applies to a solid cylinder, but the shortcut equation is 4V over 3A, where A is the cross-sectional area of the cylinder. Okay. Um, if which which axis is the axis of bending? So that force is transverse or perpendicular to Z. That's going to get my my maximum stresses at B and D. A and C are my extreme fibers, and those are going to be zero. So let's put the zeros in first. So A is a zero. C is a zero. And for the directions, we'll do the magnitude next, but for the directions, all I wanna do is copy the direction of that force at points B and D. So positive X face, negative Y direction, positive X face, negative Y direction, put it in equilibrium. Those are the arrows on top. On the left, we'll run through the calculation. That maximum shear stress is four times 90 Newtons divided by three, pi five millimeters squared. So pi r squared for that circle. And that will work out to 1.528 megapascals. 1.528 megapascals right there and 1.528 megapascals right there. All right, almost there. I'm going to zoom out to get to the next row of my table. This one says stress caused by shear in the Z direction. Do we have a shear force in the Z direction? No, we do not. So that one is another Z row. Isn't it delightful to be able to write zeros? I just love it. All right, torsional shear stress. Do we have a torque? And the way you figure that out, so the torque is going to be the one with double arrow aligned to the longitudinal axis. So yeah, we've got a torque. It's 20 E3 Newtons times millimeters. We know that torsion is at a maximum on the surface. We know that torsion is at a maximum, tors or torsional stresses. Torsional stresses are at a maximum here at the surface, and then they decrease linearly. They get smaller and smaller and smaller. By the time you get to the centroid, they're equal to zero. But all four of our points of interest, A, B, C, and D, are on the surface. Um, so we're going to get the same magnitude of stress, but different directions. Here's how to figure out the directions. This is always, always tricky, so listen carefully. With your left hand, imagine holding or stabilizing the back face or negative X plane. With your right hand, use the right hand rule right here. There's your right hand, something like that. Okay, curl your fingers, like your thumb is pointing the direction of double arrows. Curl your fingers and then turn that into a curly arrow on the face. That's an intermediate step. The curly arrow is an intermediate step. But what you want to do then is determine that the shear stress at A, that is tau sub A, goes in the negative Z direction. The shear stress at D, that's my tau sub D, goes negative Y or straight down. Tau sub C goes um, positive Z direction. 
and tau sub b goes straight up like that. Okay, do you see how the net effect of all of those stress vectors, if I took each of those stresses, multiplied it by its area, and then converted that into little differential forces, and then summed moments about the x-axis, that would turn into the torque. All right, so all we need to do is copy down those directions down below. I'm going to zoom way out and zoom out just a hair more. All right, this would look something like this. At A, I would want to go in the negative Z direction like that. At B, I would want to go straight up. At C, positive Z direction. At D, I would want to go straight down. Okay, once I've got those directions, now I can put these in equilibrium, right? There's four shear stresses on four planes, but I can only really see two of the four in this particular view. So we line all those up as needed for static equilibrium, and we're ready to do our torsional shear stress equation. Um, we're going to use T r over j plug in our torque of 20 e 3 newtons times millimeters our radius is 5 millimeters and our our equation for polar moment of inertia is pi over 2 radius to the fourth that's different than the pi over four we used in the previous step. So again, this moment of inertia and this polar moment of inertia, they're different by a factor of two. So just keep those straight. Um, yeah, plug that through. You'll get 101.9 megapascals, 101.9. same magnitude, just different directions all the way across. And at this point, we can conclude this problem just by summing vertically. So with combined stress problems, we divide and conquer. You know, step one is the static. Step two is the stress analysis. Do all six little pieces individually. And then we superimpose or sum up the results. So let's look at column A. If I can see all of this. OK, for column A, I've got 1.53 of compression. I've got more compression here, 0, 0, 0, and some shear stress. So that's going to net a total compressive stress in the x direction. That should sum to 2, 15.5. I'm going to go ahead and just make that 2, 16 for my final answer to 3 sig figs. And then I want to show those shearing stresses. and to show that to three sig figs, I'll bump it up to 102 megapascals. Okay, next column. So I've still got 1.53 of compression, zero, zero, zero. Okay, so that's going to be easy to add in. Okay, now for my shearing stresses, they're on the same planes but the opposite directions. So I want to deduct 1.528 from 101.9, but the direction of the 101.9 is going to be the winner here algebraically. And once you subtract that out to three sig figs, that comes out to 100 megapascals. On to the next column, which is point C got that compression. Now I've got tension and the tension's going to win. Okay, so 213.9 subtract out 1.53. That'll get me down to 212. This is to three sig figs of tension. Okie doke. Got a zero, a zero, a zero, but I got a shear stress here. We can just copy it down, same plane, same direction, and label 102 megapascals to three significant figures. Lastly, we go to column D. 
I've still got compression, zero, 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 and two shear stresses. Okay, so let's put that compression in here. 1.53 megapascals. Our shear stresses, they are on the same planes. That won't always be true. Okay, that won't always be true, but it is true in this problem. Same planes and same direction. So we can just add up this little one, 1 1.5, and then this big one, 101.9, match that direction. Those sum up to three sig figs as 103 megapascals. All right. Big, big, big problem here, right? Lots and lots of steps, lots of stuff that we've learned coinciding, but the big steps are number one, do your statics, double check, triple check, quadruple check this nine times out of 10, and maybe 99 times out of 100. When students have questions about this, your errors are almost always in this step, okay? you know of course it's possible to make errors doing all the stress analysis stuff too but almost always it's on the static side okay um yeah so do your statics pick it apart into all six whenever you get a zero be happy about that so happy 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 and happy and divide and conquer and then the last step is sum up sum up sum up sum up and that's your combined state of stress down at the bottom uh, thanks for tuning in. I hope this was helpful. Have a great day.